All right. It's after five, so we will get the meeting for the 23rd of August underway. Thank you all for attending. I'll do roll call first. Uh, Steve Ball. Here. Phoebe Bensiger. Here. Jan Chastain. Here. Chad Huffman. Here. Delphine Jado. Delphine, are you here? Yes. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Richard Rogers. Uh, Ronald Cairns, our alternate, is, is not here today. And uh, I'm David Fishering, and I'm here. Um, so approval of the minutes from the 26th of July. You guys all get a chance to read them, review them. Any issues? No issues? OK. Uh, then I'll entertain a motion to approve. Thanks, Jan. Do you have a second? I second. Thanks, Delphine. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? OK, the minutes are approved. Um, staff, any additions or deletions? There are none. OK, in that case, we've got two agenda items. We've got the preliminary plan development um, for the Grove. And then the, uh, was it Eilts rezone? Eilts rezone, OK, in that order. All right, staff, go ahead. All right, thank you. Uh, good evening, Planning Commissioners, and good evening, members of the public. Uh, for the first item, the Grove preliminary plan development is associated with the Grove subdivision, which came before the Planning Commission as a preliminary plat earlier this year. That subdivision preliminary plat was formally approved by Planning Commission and City Council on March 21st of this year. Uh, that subdivision is located on a site approximately 44.64 acres in size and consists of 129 single-family lots. And so just as a point of clarity, that subdivision has been approved and the subdivision itself is not what is being voted on tonight. Uh, I've been getting a few questions, certainly valid questions, and we're happy to answer them, but the uh, item being heard tonight is specifically a plan development, which is a request for deviations from city standards not on the subdivision itself. Uh, and just to further clarify, the subdivision can move forward, forward regardless of the outcome of tonight's uh, hearing. Um, again, this is an application for deviations to city standards, uh, specifically to the setbacks for open air porches, but not for the remainder of the structure. The lot lines and open space, road network, infrastructure, et cetera, that were associated with the preliminary plat that's been approved are not being changed with this application. The property is zoned R2 low density district, which is intended to provide a quiet low density development for single family residences. Uh, the subdivision consists of single family residential lots, all of which need to and will comply with minimum lot size requirements. Again, the requested deviation is to the setbacks for porch structures which would not increase or decrease the density of the subdivision. Normally, when you've seen PDs, they come at the same time as the preliminary plat, uh, but that doesn't always have to be the case. It, it particularly happens when the PD is required in order to make the subdivision possible, which has happened a few times. However, in this case, the subdivision could move forward even if the PD is not approved. So the preliminary plat was able to be approved prior to the hearing for the PD plan. According to our comprehensive plan, this area is listed as residential mixed density low, which provides primarily for single family homes as well as small amounts of attached residential dwelling units, uh, such as duplexes or townhomes. As mentioned, the property is zoned R2. Adjacent zoning includes more R2, R1, R3, and some areas outside of city limits. And so this table shows the deviations being requested as part of this PD. Uh, this slide here is really the sole item that's being voted on for this, uh, this application. The column on the right shows the standard setbacks for the R2 zoning district, which the uh, majority of the house structure would still need to comply with. And then the center column shows the requested setbacks for open air porches for houses within the subdivision. Uh, you can see that they are requesting a front setback of 17 feet, side of 5 feet, rear of 15 feet, and corner lots of 14 feet as opposed to 25, 6, 20, and 20, respectively. Uh, as you all know, a plan development does require at least 20% of the area to be dedicated as open space. Uh, typically, standard subdivisions only require 8%. Uh, this actually was already met by the preliminary plat. And so, as I said, the open space has not changed. And these lot lines that are shown on this plat have not changed from the approved uh, subdivision, which can be built whether or not this PD is approved. And so in summary, staff finds that the PD is in, in compliance with PD regulations, and the proposal is not adverse to the public health, safety, and welfare. Staff recommends the conditional approval of the Grove preliminary plan development. And with that, uh, the applicant is here. I would ask him to uh, please come up and 
State your name and address. Uh, Chris Cook, um, 2049 Brookway, Montrose, Colorado. Um, basically, the PD is uh, all the setbacks like he was talking about as far as the housing structures and everything is status quo. Uh, we have porches in, in our design, so we have eight, uh, possibly nine home designs. And those porches do in, uh, encroach a little bit into the you know, general setbacks that are required. And so we're asking for a variation because it's, um, the, it's a master plan community. And so that everything will fun, funnel and flow um, better if we're able to do this. And it's kind of a, it, it's just a really nice area. So I don't know exactly what you want to say. I didn't have a presentation plan for this. Sorry, thanks, Chris. Do you guys have any questions? Sure. You bet. Go ahead, Chair. So, to me, a porch is on the front of the house. Is that an accurate assessment? Uh, not in this scenario, no. We have porches in the, on side yards and, oh. and in the rear of the houses as well. You can go to the grovemontrose.com. You can see the designs of the homes. But we have uh, side yard porches, back porches, um, and a lot, a lot of side porches. Okay. Right. So why would a front porch decrease the space in the back of the house for the backyard well we have back porches as well so it decreases that i mean uh it, it's up to a buyer to i mean they have the option to accept the porches as we've designed them they have the op opportunity to not accept the porches and to have more yard um, we're trying to appeal to a wide um a wide variety of people that are coming into the city and that may want to have minimal um, uh, yard. landscaping yeah. needs that, you know, or upkeep that they, you know, see fit. And then all on top of that, you know, try to mitigate the amount of snow removal in the winters, uh, for anybody who's coming in that doesn't want to shovel snow. I mean, we can go in terms of the elderly, we can go in terms of the young, just in general, though, it's people that don't want to, um, that want to have that over the porch kind of you know enclosure that you know blocks out sun and uh, and keeps snow off of concreted areas as well thank you i have a question so when you submitted the plat that we approved in the past did you not have those plans already for the homes no ma'am okay and we were in the process of designing uh the homes for the subdivision at that process at that time so can we solve that problem by replatting and still with it being within those um, setbacks that are set by the city? No, I can't solve that problem by doing that. Okay, and those homes are available now? Uh, they'll be available in about a month. Okay. Um, is there a way to fix that problem any other way than by changing the subdivision requirements? No. Um, I guess I would ask, like, what would be the concern with a porch enclosure? Um, in, in, it, it's just an enclosure, so it's not like a full structure. Uh, and I think that that's super important that we uh, we note that this is not like an entire structure of a home. It isn't a foundation wall. It's not something that's going to encroach uh, inside a building. You know, inside of those limits, it's uh, it's just an overhang hung porch that. Uh, like, you know, roof structure that allows that porch to be 100% covered. Yeah, and so the concern is not specifically the porch, in my opinion. It's more when other people submit a subdivision and we approve it, and then if we bend the rule for everybody, it's more about setting a precedent and having to do that, that then for everybody, right? So my concern is more where is it coming from, why are we doing it, and why... In your opinion, why should we... I understand that people are looking for a smaller yard, um, and that that can cater to that demand. I see that. Um, but if we can go back to the side-by-side. -side. Um, that I one, can yes. Step in just for some clarity here. I would love um, that. Because that's a whole of seven feet right at the front. Um, it's just, it's a big difference. I don't, I don't know, we're, we're talking about precedent, but I don't know that this necessarily sets precedent. 
I say that because this is a plan development application. It's not a subdivision application. And the intent of a plan development application is kind of negotiating factors. Um, so, this, so there is adequate open space throughout. Um, and then this, uh, the applicant can deviate from, from certain standards. In this case, that would be uh, the setbacks. Sometimes it's reduced street standards. Sometimes it's reduced other things. So you see that with PD applications, and that's really the intent of the PD application. Know that this is not the subdivision application. That was already approved. So hopefully that maybe clarifies a little bit. Um, and then the, the overall intent, again, is just to have a little bit more flexibility for the developer uh, right. at the end of the day for, for porches. Yeah, and I, I would add in the a PD application, whether it's this or another PD application, provides an opportunity for a developer to uh, kind of do something that's a little less standard than, say, the standard cookie cutter subdivision. Uh, not that there's anything wrong with a cookie cutter subdivision, but it provides the opportunity for someone to uh, at least request uh, an opportunity to do something a little more unique. Thank you for that. And then, then let me ask you, as we lose kind of green space at the front, at the back, so we've got five feet, seven feet, that's about, you know, total of 12 feet, do we have more green space added to the subdivision? Uh, we have more than the recommended amount of green space uh, or uh, the minimum requirements already in that green space. Awesome. Um, and I know that uh, Will and Jason probably speak to that in terms of the, like the actual quantity, but we're well above uh, the amount of quantity of green space that we need for this subdivision um, by uh, at minimum, I think 10% above what that is. So this, <laughs> this subdivision alone gives ample amounts of green space, um, recreation uh, abilities, as well as like a family environment. Um, so it, it kind of, I, I believe that it, it washes. And it doesn't happen in all scenarios. However, it does happen. Um, one of my, and I, and I guess I can say this uh, because I am, you know, talking to everybody up here. One of the things that I genu genuinely dislike about a lot of subdivisions is that you never fully fi see them finished. Um, we have subdivisions, like the subdivision that I live in is 20 years old, and we still have three open lots. So we've designed all these homes to fit with inside these parameters to guarantee a full finished subdivision versus, you know, three or five lots that don't necessarily meet the requirements. And so we went down the road of the plan development so that we can finish the subdivision in its entirety in a, in a timely manner versus uh, having three or five or seven lots like I see in a lot of subdivisions holding out for a long standing period of time. Thank you. You guys got any other questions for Mr. Cook? All right. Thanks, Chris. Thank Have you. See. Cheers. All right. Um, at this time, we'll open up the uh, this agenda item to public comment. If there's anybody out there that would like to raise a question or concern, um, now is the time to do it. Just raise your hand, I'll call you up here. You state your name and address. Ma'am, go ahead. So you'll be after. Um, real quick, where do we get the time now, guys? I can't remember, it's been a while. Does it show up to anybody, like up on the screen or anything? Yes, no, maybe. I, I'll. <laughs> okay, uh, yeah, there we go. So you, so, maybe you, got, you got three minutes to, to speak, okay? Okay, my name is Brittany Oldroyd. I live at 3340 Ivory Court in the Brown Ranch Subdivision. A few uh, questions I have, and I had to look some of these things up. Um, we're th because it has to do with setbacks, I, have, I had to look it up. And uh, from my research, it looks like setbacks are there for um, access by first responders, utility workers, that's the reason for setbacks. Obviously, Montrose set some um, at some point feeling that that was adequate to enable those things happen. In my experience, whenever you lessen those setbacks, you see more cars from those homes parked in the street, which is a safety issue for me. I have kids and you have more cars on the street. You can't see those kids when they're coming out of their driveways on their bikes. Um, so I see problems there. Um, also, just uh, spacing between the houses, they're getting very close. We live in an agriculture area where they're burning all the time and oftentimes that will be during wind storms. Um, and so I would hate to see like multiple houses get taken out because those setbacks are 
taken out, and so their houses are much closer together. Um, as I understand it, those are some of the issues. Um, other issues I looked up um, in terms of ventilation, lighting, those kinds of things are helped by having those big, those setbacks. I looked up the um, Envision Montrose 2040 comprehensive plan. It does look like the um, you know you guys took uh, the city took uh, s the communities. Uh, surveys and to really set those in place. Um, some of the things I see is they're looking to uh, preserve Montrose's small town rural character and natural environment. If we have a lot of these green nature spaces covered with patio and things like that, I have concerns about how that's going to look in terms of that rural setting. Um, also, I see um, in the introduction chapter of that Envision Comprehensive Plan, it says we want to promote the health, safety, moral order, convenience, prosperity, and general welfare. Inside that also adequate provisions for traffic, um, promoting light and air. These are all concerns I have because these are reasons for which I found setbacks are in place. Um, I kind of at this point feel like the development subdivision, like we were very open to it. We had some concerns about traffic and the roads that we would share um, that were brought up in the last meeting. And subsequent visits with city members have said, well, it, you guys are kind of way out there and we don't see those roads being developed to what you need. Like um, there's a map here I just picked up on my way in that sends bikers down that 6725 uh, road. Um, we have two lanes. You can't see oncoming traffic there. This subdivision adds at least 250 cars if there's two cars per house. Now, I know that doesn't have anything to do with setbacks, but my concern is safety, and it looks like we're disregarding the safety factor of all of this. So that's, that would be what I have to say. Thank you for your time. All right. Thanks, Brittany. Sir? And just a reminder, Brittany, you did an ex excellent job. Uh, just make sure your comments are addressed to us here at the commission and not the staff or anybody else sitting in the audience. Thank you for your time. My name is Michael Ambrose. I live in the Mountain Pine subdivision uh, on Glacier Drive, 3038 Glacier Drive. I've just got a question, and that is, has there been any effort to engineer this design so that they are in compliance with the current um, rules and regulations. So I would ask you, sir. Michael, Michael, how, how, to address, address to yes, so, so very good. So that's my question is um, how many lots would be lost if they redesign their plat, not their roads, none of that, but to be in compliance with the um, current regulations? Okay. Anyone else? My name is Kyle Oldroyd. I live at 2720, or excuse me, 3340 Ivory Court in Montreal. Sorry, I get nervous when I talk to people. I do, my, I do know my address. Um, Lots of concerns here, and one huge frustration. When we came to the last meeting, a, a beautiful video was shown of this subdivision with houses. Apparently, that wasn't the truth. I don't understand how we have the plats designed and everything, and we're shown literal pictures of houses that are apparently different from what we're talking about today. I don't see a new video with the changes, so I, I honestly have a problem with that. We need to, when, when we built our house, we, had, we knew what the lot was, we knew what the setbacks were, and we had to build within those regulations. So I, that's concerning, that's very concerning. Additionally, I'm concerned about fires. My wife spoke about you, you know, every farm, and, and there's, there's farmland surrounding this subdivision, they all burn. And I have seen fires start to burn out of control and people are, there, people are there trying to control that. Very concerning when you have less space between houses and I'm guessing overhanging porches can start on fire. 
Um, another thing, and I know it's not about this, but I went out and measured today. The bicycle route, there's 11 inches of asphalt on the side of the road. There is no shoulder, there is 11 inches, less than one foot. And we are adding traffic. And if the setbacks don't fit, maybe we should make it so that the setbacks fit in an appropriate amount of land and decrease the number of houses in that subdivision. Thank you. Thanks, Kyle. Is there anyone else? Going once? Going twice? All right. We'll close the public uh, comment portion for this agenda item um, and bring it back up here uh, for discussion and repointing of questions. Um, just to reiterate what staff said earlier, um, that the the subdivision, as uh, it was shown, I don't know, if Will, Will, if you can go to the, I think it's the last slide you have on there. Um, there's an image of the, there you go. Um, that has already been approved uh, by city council. Um, so as far as density and everything else, um, the applicant can build uh, with those existing lot lines. Um, and I, you'll, you'll have to remind me, staff, I, for some reason, I think we actually talked about this potentially happening at the last meeting, that uh, the developer did think that there may be some lots that they might have to come and do this for. I could just be creating that in my head. I don't remember. Um, we'd have to go back at the minutes and see if we can figure it out. But um, I, don't, I don't think it's new to us that this was a potential um, Chad, I don't know if you remember or not, but um, anyway, uh, I think the uh, obviously the, some of the concerns here are, are are valid ones. The the but the the fact remains that like the road and the bike path and all that, those are all things that hopefully will get addressed by the city as density does increase in this development and others in the surrounding area. Um, but those are all issues that. You know, aren't part of what uh, the developers asking for today. Uh, Chris, would you mind coming back up here, please? So yeah, unfortunately, we don't have your uh, your video today. Um, so, but but if you if you could uh, just go and explain that. Um, yeah. That, so that, that, that the design hasn't changed. You're just asking to be able to actually design what you showed in the video. <laughs> that's exactly what. Because <laughs> a lot doing. of them had porches and stuff in the video. They, they, they had porches in the video. If you go to the if you go to our website, thegrovemontrose.com, uh, there's a new video with the homes that are actually being built uh, on that website. Um, and you can do a fly through of that. And it's all the same. I mean, it's the same style homes. It's the same porch enclosures. They were shown on that original video. Uh, we just realized that we had a deviation in those on those uh, overhangs that we needed to work through. And you were correct, we had uh, brought that up in the last meeting that we were gonna be coming forward uh, with a planned development uh, at the time of preliminary plat. So that was that was correct. And so you said you had earlier eight or nine units that are really the ones that are causing this potential issue if they were to build the covered porches? Yeah, and so when we, when we did it, we had originally mapped this out to um, subjectify those eight or nine lots that would, uh, would cause that, that issue. And uh, I was talking to Will and Jason, everybody said, you know, you just need to do a PD for the whole subdivision. So not every house has this, uh, has, has this um, encroachment. There's a, there's a selective few and, and it kind of, and it's, there's some variables on what house goes on what lot. And we've already done all the legwork on that to know which houses fit with inside the setbacks. Those porches encroach, you know, mildly if a buyer wants to say add an owl's nest onto a specific lot. Like that's what we're talking about today versus, you know, possibly adding a chipmunk cottage with a larger porch. Um, so, but we are only talking about a selective amount of those homes that are affected. And in the PD application, it actually uh, gives a variance to all lots in there. Um, 
but those houses have been designed uh, to fit with inside of all the city regulations with the exception of the porches. And we just feel like it's an added amenity for our home buyers. I think right now, um, I zoomed in here earlier, I think it's like 21%, 21 point something uh, open space um, as, it, as it stands now. Is that correct, staff, on, the, on that PD thing? I can't see in the bottom down there. It's very small, but um, it says twenty. Yeah. Uh, twenty-one point nine eight. Okay, so twenty-one point nine eight percent. And what is the requirement for a PD twenty uh, okay. for a standard subdivision uh, per the annexation agreement? It would be eight. Okay, so we we are over that, not by much, but we are over it. Uh, my question then would be, if you encroach with nine or eight units, are we still going to meet twenty percent? Yes, yeah, so the open space is not being changed. Okay. Um, this, this is the same amount of open space that was proposed during the um, uh, preliminary plat hearing. Okay. Yeah, and to, just to, to clarify that, I think William's spot on. Um, the, the yard areas for each individual lot, that's not accounted for in the open space. Um, so that's just something to, to keep in mind. Okay. Uh, and then, so, th the request here, I think staff kind of made it sound like it was the side and back porches. Uh, Chad asked if it was a front porch as like, I, I think I'm in the same mindset as Chad that I just think front, front porch. Uh, and then um, Brittany did bring up, if we are uh, extending the setback in the front, are we gonna be pushing cars out? Will the, is there room, are there room for garages now or not? Yeah, no, the, I mean, we, all, all these homes come with two car garages and, and an optional third bay garage as well. Okay. Do you have any other questions? On Chris? the garage subject and that, that garage itself is not going any further towards the street. So there's still, if, if the Toyota Camry is being parked in front of the house, there's still parking space for that Toyota Camry. 100%, yeah. There, we're not going to encroach, uh, you know, part of our HOA docs as well. I mean, uh, th that gets into the weeds a little bit, but we don't allow, you know, vehicles parked outside the street for uh, any period of time. Um, you know, for the most part, you know, you're parking in your in your driveway and in your garage. So don't don't leave because I'm sure we're going to have more questions. Um, Will, can you talk to us about the fire concern? We talk about you know whole cities burning down in, in Maui and fire running from one building to the next. Mm -hmm. What happens when there's these setback uh, requests associated with our local fire department and them getting involved with our PDs? So uh, the original request actually for the side setbacks was uh, four feet. Um, we actually pushed back on that to uh, require that minimum of five feet. Uh, the fire codes um, in a typical subdivision permit or a typical building permit, permit uh, five feet of set, setbacks. Uh, some zoning districts, particularly downtown and the commercial districts, do theoretically allow for uh, setbacks to be closer than that five feet. However, when that happens, it does uh, need to meet fire rated construction standards, um, something which you know, Sharon might be able to talk a little bit more about. If Archie was here, he could talk a little bit more about it. but. Um, when you have that uh, five feet, five foot setback, side setback um, on each lot, that means there's a minimum of 10 feet of separation between uh, any, any structure, uh, and that meets the, the standard fire codes. And Great. Thank keep you. in mind, yeah, as far as building permits go, that goes through its own permitting process as well. So each, each house, each structure will get its own permit uh, and fire rating and building, a, building standards and quality are all looked at at that time as well. And maybe if I could chime in on the fire protection side as well. So the fire department does review both the initial subdivision and these PD plans. So they've had a chance to weigh in on those. Um, you know, the wild, the interface with agriculture and, and um, urban centers is always a thing and it's something that um, we're cognizant of and, and um, don't, don't worry about it. it doesn't keep us up at night we do have great um, fire protection in this area so um, this portion isn't within the city's water districts in tri counties um, but their pressure and flows are better than some of ours just due to the nature of their system in this area they're near a big booster pump 
Um, and so as far as, even though it's outside of our water district, it still has to meet all fire standards for hydrant spacing, um, hose lay lengths and all those things. And, uh, you know, so the ability of our fire department to respond and, and battle those fires, um, they're, they're comfortable in these. We have this with, we have these things come up with access and stuff on this subdivision and others. Um, and we always make sure to consult with them to make sure they're fully comfortable that if something were to get from the ag into the residential areas, they're able to tamp it down and you wouldn't have a, you know, rampant fire uh, type issue. There's, and there's different things that drive fires with winds and, and different um, things that are in play. But, you know, given uh, the conditions out here, they've expressed that they're comfortable and, and they, they wouldn't allow us to go forward to even to this level if they weren't. So. I have one comment. It has nothing to do with the, with the variance, but you're the driveway guy, I'm the egress guy, and there's only one way in and out of the subdivision, right? Sorry, plan development. Uh, um, in the full subdivision, no. There, I meant plan development. There's still, there's still two there's points. One. Yeah, there's a there's an egress and an access uh, on the south oh, okay. side as well. I see that now. I'm sorry. Withdrawn. I have a quick question about. Go ahead, Delphine. Th um, we're doing. So it's 126 lots, right? How many houses are you anticipating will need that? Because we're doing it for the whole subdivision. So what you have to understand is that we're we're essentially giving you a free pass to do it on all 126 lots, <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> right? Am I right? Uh, That's uh, what uh, theoretically, uh, yes. Um, however, these homes are already designed. Um, they're designed to fit with inside the city's parameters with the exception of, the of a couple porches. And it, and the, and all the of this day. happens in phase one. Um, and so, Phase one being on the on the the north side of the subdivision, which is the first 54 lots, so towards the top of the screen there, um, and they and they really run up alongside of you know there's there's just some narrower lots that created that concern for us, so that we could create the same uh, feel, look, and flow throughout the entire subdivision. Um, so and, give or take, what do you anticipate it to be outside of the norm? Like I said, I, I and and Jay said too, and and David, I I believe that, you know, we're really talking about a couple lots, um, oh. in the in in the grand scheme of things. I have some very big lots. We're talking about a couple lots that this actually is affected by, um, and those are variables based on what home gets selected to put on what lot, and. This, I mean, is a, it's, so th that would be probably the best way that I could say that is, uh, you know, if somebody really wants to buy lot 21 that happens to be in, you know, and they, they don't want the home that fits with inside those parameters, but another one fits with inside that building footprint and they want the porch added, that porch extends, you know, roughly two foot um, past and it's just the overhang of the porch that becomes the encroachment on the subdivision, so it's not a full structure. It's just the overhang of a roof. Okay, thank you. You guys got any other questions for Mr. Cook? No, nope. Steve. Okay, thanks, Chris. Again. Yeah, thank you, David. Um, yeah, I think just again that the the developer's not asking the applicant's not asking for an increase in density. Uh, the number of lots is staying the exact same as we approved already, and the city council approved. Um, so. I don't, I personally don't have a problem with the variance, but. So talking about Delphine's concerns associated with exceptions, I actually kind of like this scenario that the whole development has the exception. That way anybody who buys into the property, into the neighborhood, they know what they're getting at. They know that anywhere within the neighborhood there could be an exception. And so it makes it just very easy for everybody to understand what they've got and the, let the market decide if they are comfortable with these smaller setbacks then folks will buy these neighbors or sorry buy, buy into this neighborhood and in buy these houses if they're not comfortable they avoid this neighborhood so I, I'm kind of of the opinion that for a health and safety reason I don't have any personal issues with it um, let the market decide and let people be adults from their own perspective and what they like and what they don't. So yeah, I'm very supportive. 
You guys got anything else? No? All right. In that case, um, I'll entertain a motion. I would like to entertain a motion. Like to entertain one or make one? <laughs> make one and you all entertain it. Uh, hereby make a motion to recommend the City Council approval of the preliminary plan development application with the following conditions. The approval of this preliminary plan development is expressly conditioned upon the City staff ensuring that all policies, regulations, ordinances, and municipal code provisions are met and that the applicant adequately addresses all staff concerns prior to the execution of the final plan development. City staff is not authorized by this approval to execute the final plan uh, development prior to all conditions being satisfied. The request meets the code criteria based on the evidence and staff testimony presented at this hearing and in the staff report. All right, thanks, Richard. Do I have a second? Thank you, Phoebe. Uh, you guys have anything to discuss about the motion? No? Okay. Delphine, anything to discuss about? Okay. Uh, in that case, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? All right, the motion passes unanimously. Yeah. All right, staff, agenda item number two. All right, thank you. Uh, good evening again. So this is a rezone application, which is in reference to a property located on the north side of Ogden Road, as can be seen on this map. This is known as Lot 1 of the Parks and Wheeler subdivision as, and is approximately 10.8 acres in size. The property is currently zoned R2 low density district, and the applicant is seeking a rezone to R3A medium high density district. Uh, one quick thing I do want to point out on this map here. Uh, the Dry Cedar Creek 2 annexation that you heard somewhat recently is located to the southwest here. Uh, it's not shown as annexed into the city limits yet on this map just because it is so recent, but that has uh, formally been approved and annexed, and so that is uh, R3, so R3A zoning as well. Um, the other surrounding zoning districts include R2, R3A. Uh, the area across the street is zoned as R4 high density district and there are also some areas uh, outside of city limits. Uh, the applicant did ask me to include this graphic here showing some of the commercial development that's occurring uh, in the proximity of this, this property. Uh, the property was originally annexed and zoned in 2001. Since then, of course, there has been significant commercial development along Townsend that you see here. The rec center has been built just down the road, as well as pedestrian and bike paths, and of course, some residential development uh, that you've just seen along Dry Cedar Creek. This slide uh, shows the rezone criteria, which need to be considered with any rezone application. The amendment to the zoning map should not be adverse to the public health, safety, and welfare, and the amendment should be in substantial conformity with the master plan or conditions in the area affected or adjacent areas have changed materially since the area was last zoned. As mentioned on the last slide, the area was zoned in 2001, and the area has certainly changed materially to, due to commercial and residential development, mainly to the west and some on the east. The applicant has provided some pictures of the site. Currently, it is a vacant property with no current developments, but they are applying for R3A, which our code says provides for an area which is suitable for single-family homes, duplexes, and multifamily residences, along with certain other compatible, compatible land uses. According to our comprehensive plan, this is listed as residential mixed density low, which provides primarily for single family homes, as well as small amounts of attached residential development, meaning duplexes and townhomes. The proposal would also meet several of the goals which are outlined within our comprehensive plan. Goal five within our land use chapter states that we should promote higher density infill and redevelopment of underutilized sites that can be easily accessed by foot, bike, and or public transit. Our housing goals outline the desire to encourage a greater variety of housing types, tenure, and density in order to meet the community's needs. The goals also include the encouragement of a mix of housing price ranges, including uh, increased access to affordable and workforce housing. Uh, in summary, staff does find that the proposal meets the rezone criteria in section 11712 of our municipal code. It is in compliance with the comprehensive plan and its goals and objectives. 
It's compatible with the existing uses in the surrounding area and conditions have changed uh, in the affected area since the property was annexed in 2001. Staff does recommend approval of the rezone application. Uh, the applicant is here tonight. If they would uh, please step forward, state your name and address. Hi, uh, Angela Ielts, 18341 B Road, Delta, Colorado. Good evening. Um, pretty much the city has covered most of what I would add to that. I have lived here my entire life. I have worked here and had a business here for 43 years, so I've watched Montrose change probably as much as anybody in the community. Honestly, I kind of always thought I would build. I grew up in the, I finished high school in the house adjacent to it. There's a great bluff on this property. Thought I'd build my dream home. Look at the San Juans. Being a business owner, I see our need for affordable housing, and I keep watching the developments that go through, and we're missing the mark. They're coming in at 600,000, they're coming in at 800,000, they're coming in at 900,000. I can't find employees because they can't move here. So part of our move in doing this, and it really was at one point where the infill is to me, I hate seeing our agricultural lands outside the city limits being broken down and developed into subdivisions when we can infill and utilize the properties that are inside. We're close to bike paths, the rec center. There's just so much there. It just makes more sense for me not to be selfish in the sense of building my house and help bring people here. And I think the higher density in this area is really compatible with everything that's planned because then you can start to bring in some townhomes and maybe some multifamily units where we can actually bring the pricing down, get people some rents, get some affordability outside of a, an apartment, but also outside of an $800,000 home. So that's kind of my angle from coming here and open to any questions or anything you might have. Thank you, Angela. You just have yeah. questions? Go, go, go ahead, Phoebe. You got one over there. Yeah. Hey. Hey. Um, so you don't have plans for it now? I mean, you just want the density changed for the options to put high density or? Years ago, my mom had looked at it. She owned it prior to me purchasing it from an estate. We had a 32 lot subdivision that she had kind of plotted out. We've contemplated back and forth over the last probably 12 years developing that plan. Or then we've started looking at maybe some townhomes or, or triplexes. Like I've seen some really well done ones in Grand Junction area or other areas. So I'm still on the fence with it. Part of the problem in that location is infrastructure, honestly. So one of the last times I actually had met with the city was probably a year or two ago, is we were gonna have to foot the bill to get the sewer to our property from the roundabout. And um, so still potentially contemplating that and doing the development ourselves, but some of that is lagging. So like the, the other development, when you're talking about the bike path and things like that, the sewer down Ogden and the bike paths and some of that stuff's not quite caught up there. So I kind of want to preemptively, if we decide to do it ourselves, do it. And if not, then it kind of opens the door for maybe some of these developers that are coming into the south to us that want to do a little bit more of that cheaper, lower income affordable stuff that they can come in and maybe do it as well. So your, your plan, which is not really just to make it opened up for that, you you would like to see personally like duplexes townhomes three three you're not looking at and i know you're not looking at a stinking thing but do you foresee apartment buildings maybe like a developer no, would because you encourage that or discourage that if you have to go to apartments then you kind of kind of have to look at that r4 zoning um so to me i i think one of the things we're lacking in a lot of our subdivisions is um when they brought up the cookie cutter thing in the last presentation too i i've seen his houses i think they're beautiful um, to me, when you have some single family homes, maybe a duplex, maybe a triplex, still mix it up, but so it's not that cookie cutter thing either. Um, more zero scaping because of water, more just something a little more modern for some of that where you can have kind of a mixed use of it, but not something that's so over the top that you're just packed in there with apartments. Like to me, there's other places for that. Mm -hmm. But the reality is that if we approve this, it doesn't matter in the sense that we're here for rezoning and not to approve, you know, triplex or duplexes. So as to see, do we want the high density or the medium it's density medium. that you already have, right? Correct. Right. You guys got any other questions? No? All right, Angela, for the time being, you can have a seat. All right, thank you. Thank you. You guys got any questions for staff? No? All right. Uh, based on the lot size, 
can you guys do math real quick and tell us the density differences between what it currently is and what we would be approving potentially with R3A? Jason's doing some math right now. Okay, thank you. Yep. <laughs> just just want to state it for the record before people start asking. We revised our code, so uh, as, as you're well aware, so now I'm finding my sections here. Give okay. me just a second. Should we do public comments? Do you need time? Yeah, I'm going to open up public comment while you're doing that. I think that's fair. Okay. Yep. All right. Uh, we'll open up the public comment portion. Um, for those of you that didn't hear my question, I'm asking the staff to get us a number on the minimum, uh, sorry, maximum number of lots difference between R2, which is what it's currently zoned, and R3A, which is what the applicant's requesting. It typically is a cause of concern for most people in the public when they come to rezoning hearings, so that way we have that number for you. So if that is your concern, we'll be addressing it here in a minute anyway. Um, but we will open up the public comment portion. Um, I don't have my sheet in front of me that I normally read, because I'm sure there's more than one of you that wants to talk. Uh, three minutes is your lot of time. Please stay within that time. We'll cut you off at three minutes if you're still going on. Um, be respectful of everybody. Uh, address all your comments. Can't stress that enough to the commission up here. Please don't turn around and talk to the people in the back or the applicant or the staff. We will address any of your questions and concerns back to those people after uh, the public comment portion is done. All right, um, with that, who wants to go first? John, <laughs> I see you back there hiding. <laughs> I, I will quickly, uh, we did the math here. And okay. for the record, I had done the math and just forgot to bring the post-it okay. note that I'd written it on. Um, I figured you did. But. Yeah. Uh, with the current zoning, R2, uh, single family lots could have a maximum, in theory, of 62 single family lots. Uh, uh, in R3A, if they were divided into single family lots, in theory, it would be a maximum of 72 lots. If it were developed as a multifamily, a single multifamily building, uh, the maximum would be 162 units. Uh, that is with the caveat that usually the maximum multifamily number is not realistic. Uh, of course, you also have to consider that you have to include parking and landscaping. Uh, all of the other site uh, site development improvements as well. Okay. Thanks, William. All right. Who wants to go first? Anybody? No one. Now's your now's your chance. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> you showed up to the meeting. You might as well say something. <laughs> State your name and address again for us, yes. please. Uh, Michael Ambrose, and I live in the Mountain Pine Subdivision, 3038 uh, Glacier Drive, which is just down the street from the property that we're talking about. Um, I've got a couple of questions because I haven't been to a meeting in about the last four months. But prior to that, <clears throat> uh, I, I understand there is some R4 property on the other side that's going to be multi-level, multi-family, is, isn't that correct? Can you? Yeah, we'll have, we'll have staff bring that slide back up here. Okay. Well, uh, this, the, the lady who owns this property now, uh, she seems like an extremely reasonable person and wants to do uh, something that's uh, good for the property and good for the city. But my question is, if it happens to leave her control and somebody else buys it, it's still going to be uh, a new zoning uh, regulation, and they may uh, elect to do something completely different than uh, what her ideas are. I, you know, it, it sort of uh, scares me when a person comes up and says, you know, I want medium de density, even though the entire neighborhood has not been uh, multi-density 
property the entire time. And so that's a concern that I have. Um, I've only lived here for three years, but um, I'd like to continue to live, live here for a long time. So uh, I, I thank you, and if you can address any of those little issues that I mentioned, I would appreciate it. Thanks, Michael. Okay. Cheers. Thank you. All right. Next. <laughs> Hello, I am Katie Brown, and I reside at 2110 5500 Road in Delta. And I am here this evening to represent um, a property owner adjacent to this property in question. Um, I, I do express some concern on their behalf of the rezoning, and if it was sold without the intent of this use of this property. So for example, within the painted wall, we were given um, some idea of what that property was be used for, and we felt that it maintained the integrity of the surrounding areas. So I think that's one of um, our concerns as far as what that use is gonna be and the plan for that property because it would directly affect us as well as just that neighborhood in general. Um, so that would be something that we would like to see without like saying, yes, we're okay with this. We're kind of on the fence there. Right. Thanks, Katie. Thank you. All right, anyone else? No? There you go. John Renfro, 1832 South Townsend. Um, just want to just say a, a quick thing just on infrastructure or other stuff like that. Um, it should be a value to the city if we're able to go off and utilize um, as much density as we have with the improvements that are going through. The road infrastructure utility aspects that are going to be improved along this entire corridor and section are going to be pretty significant when we're going through staff and, you know, Scott, engineering, everything. Could we'll go off and look at that when you're going through. But if they do that entire stretch, it's going to be less cost going off and doing some of these other remote developments, other locations. Um, this is a logical piece just with one step going through. Uh, you know, with regards to the property itself, the location is advantageous just because of the walkability studies. So if you look at the Chaffa aspect, you look at some of the other things that are out there, the location is, is pretty critical, either on Odell, Ogden, all that other stuff for the rec center and stuff like that. So. Um, I just want to make sure that, you know, I'm highlighting some of the other things that are kind of going through that, that hopefully we can leverage some of the stuff that we're going through and creating around that for some of the higher density, either from the, the, the I would say the, you know, shopping, the recreation aspects to hopefully, you know, utilize that for more growth, a better growth pattern is what I'd probably go say. So I just want to just put that in. Thanks, John. Sorry, David. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anybody else out there? Yes, ma'am, come on up. Hi. Is it? My name is Nancy Brown, and I'm also um, a member of Mountain Pines at 3009 Glacier Drive, as well as this entire row. And I'm the only one that has the guts to come up except for Michael. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. So, um, I've been watching the development that's just uh, behind the rec center, and I pulled over and talked to the manager, and and he let me know that they're um, they're doing two apart three-story apartment buildings, and then a clubhouse, and 68 units, and then once that is complete, I guess they said June of next year, that they plan to do the same thing on the lot next door. And um, my concern is uh, traffic. And just thinking about the amount of cars that are gonna go, it's a single, um, there's just two lanes, 
and um, how many cars just in those two developments could be another 300 cars. I don't understand how it works with parking and if you allow a certain amount of cars per unit when you're talking about that much density. And then correct me if I'm wrong, but I, it's my understanding that sidewalks and improvements that the city will do eventually to widen Ogden will happen in stages. And, and I don't understand that prescription and when that happens. So my real concern is the amount of traffic um, and safety and density. I mean, it sounds like that's gonna be a lot of density right there in, on Ogden and that whole little area between Ogden and Odell. So that's, those are my thoughts and hopefully you can talk about traffic and cars and density and should I go sit down now? <laughs> Thanks, Nancy. We, we will. We'll, we'll, we'll ask okay. the questions for you. Okay. <laughs> All right. Anyone else? Oh, we'll get you next, Chris. Hello everyone, my name is John Adonley. I'm at 2321 Mountain Pines Drive, same edition, rest of these folks. I'm gonna tell you what's going on right now out there. We walk our dog every day, a couple miles. I'm gonna tell you there's no traffic enforcement. You can't, there's no sidewalks in Odell for me to get on. There's no sidewalks through on Ogden Road to get on, to get out of my addition. The last thing I need is another 200 cars put on these roads. It's just, you have no idea what it's like out there trying to walk. It's just absolutely horrific. I've never seen a police car out there. I've never seen traffic enforcement. I don't see anything out there. So help us out. Before we start stuffing more stuff in there, think about uh, what we're doing right now. That's all I ask. All right, thanks, John. Yeah. Chris Koch, zero, uh, 2049 Brookway. Um, so I live right around the corner from there, and Ogden is a main drag. I go to the bridges often. Uh, we play golf there, um, and I know the the city's expansion for widening. All the amenities are built towards the south end of town right now, and so from my perspective, if this gets rezoned from R2 to R3A, it makes it a viable option for me or another developer to come in. Uh, if they chose not to do it. It makes it a viable option to actually build that infrastructure up and to create more workforce housing housing and affordable housing. And I feel like there's a need for that in the city of Montrose more than anything. Um, as they spoke to uh, in, their, in their initial comment was that they can't get employees because they don't have anywhere to go. I just lived through that um, and it's, and it's tough to to find affordable housing, to find workforce housing. So when you hear that it might turn into a single unit apartment complex, I mean, we have one going down the road from there, uh, right beside um, the, the rec center as is right now. I live around the corner from there uh, in the Brook subdivision, and I absolutely see no need to uh, keep it as R2. I think that there has to be some higher density housing on the south side of the city, and I think it would uh, it yield to more uh, younger generations coming in, family generations coming in that want to raise their kids, and it gives people an opportunity to live, work, and play here, which is the city's motto. So um, for me, I'm all in favor of rezoning this piece. I feel like there's specific pieces that don't work out the same, but this piece specifically, um, I'm in favor of it because I looked at it once before and I thought to myself, man, if that was only zoned R3A, like we could actually make that thing pencil out. And, and I think that that's what we run up to a lot as a developer when we're coming into the city is, does it pencil in the current zoning? And in this situation, it doesn't pencil to put, because I mean, maximum unit 62. In reality, you're talking about 32, 42, 45 at most by the time you meet all the requirements 
um, and then the thing doesn't pencil. So in order to get more work, uh, you know, affordable housing here to get more workforce into the city, I think it's kind of a necessity that we start taking steps to do that. And, and I'm also very confident that the city will do uh, everything that they're planning to do to widen uh, Ogden to give us, you know, sidewalks and different things. And, and I would just uh, recommend to any neighbors around there that, you know, progress takes a little bit of time. And I think this would be progress in the right direction, being that we've already approved that in some of the other scenarios. So, well, that's really loud. Thank you. Um, <laughs> that was all. Thanks, Chris. <laughs> all right. Uh, anybody else? Nope. All right. In that case, we will close the public, uh, excuse me, the public comment portion uh, of this agenda item. Um, so, Scott, briefly, because uh, we always get all these questions and there are valid concerns and questions at zoning uh, hearings, even though the actual plan, you know, isn't, isn't anywhere. Um, but could you just talk a little bit about for these folks that may not have been to previous meetings on some of the other projects on this road uh, in this area, kind of where the city's at um, as it relates to bringing in more projects on a road that doesn't have any sidewalks and everything else? Certainly, yeah. I need my recorded Ogden Road. Trip. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, the city has a comprehensive transportation network plan that identifies, you know, classifies all of our roadways, you know, so in this area, obviously 6700 Road, Woodgate, or you're kind of north-south, and then Ogden, um, you get North Niagara, Sunnyside, um, each of those streets, um, East Oak Grove, uh, you know, get widened to minor arterial standards in our um, comprehensive plan. So um, our minor arterial standard is what's been done um, by East Oak Grove. Uh, that was back in like 2015 near Walgreens. That used to be, so that's kind of a good example as the bridges came in. Um, it was kind of out there by itself initially as most subdivisions are when they start. And they, they take a while to develop and build out. Um, you kind of hit a critical mass on traffic and you've gotten the land secured that it hits a point that it makes sense and it's financially viable for the city to, to then implement that project. So. Um, you know, the bridges built it through the bridges and then the city came in and built the stretch between the bridges and Townsend um, as a follow-up to there. So this is, this is kind of the next progression of that. Um, and yeah, it gets built to the full standard with um, sidewalks in each direction, bike lanes in each direction, turn lanes, through lanes, you know, the whole, whole bit. Um, so for Ogden right now, um, it's really tall order. It's, it's financially infeasible for the city to go and just fix Ogden today. Um, right now there's, I think it's either 15 or 16 different property owners that um, for us to get wide enough right of way to do it, we can't just go put in roads. We have to purchase that land or if those properties develop, um, they have to dedicate that land so that we can secure that right of way over time. So, you know, as this is another good example of one that comes in. Um, I, I don't know if it's secure on this property or not, but in general, as developments occurring, we're able to secure that right of way. Um, sometimes they pay in towards a pot or improve on their frontage as they go. Um, Mountain Pines is a good example. You know, they have done their frontage improvements along the way. And in theory, if everybody does that, all of a sudden at the end, we'll have a road. Um, depends on the economic conditions and if that's out by itself, whether that gets done at that time. But um, generally speaking, um, you know, that road is about 15 million to do right now. Um, that's not, again, feasible for us to do. We do about 5 million in capital per year and we don't have really any debt. Um, so it's something we pay as we go um, and kind of uh, bite off in stages. So a good example is the apartment complex coming in now um, in 2024, that kind of helped spawn. We secured the right of way there. That helped spawn two projects over there. So the city's replacing the bridge um, on the Lutzenheiser Canal there to get, get, to get it wider for both traffic safety. It's even too narrow for traffic right now, um, or it's not the most ideal configuration um, to get wider so we can have better traffic safety and sidewalks on that. That's gonna be a 2025 project. Um, but then earlier in 2024, we are planning to do sidewalk curb and gutter on the south side of Ogden um, to get that up to that development. And then if they're working on a next stage, it'd likely be a natural progression that we then go along the Lutzenheiser and get to the next one. Um, there is development, uh, wor they're working on preliminary designs for the next development to the east of there. And so you can kind of see how it can be bit off in chunks. Um, because again, for us to go out and purchase 16 pieces of property, mostly in the county, or not pieces, but slivers, mostly in the county, um, 
that just adds to that cost and contention for a product that we can't even build yet. So um, it does take time, um, but also the nice part is the subdivisions generally develop out relatively slowly. You know, good examples, um, Bear Creek, um, you know, it's been developing for 20 years and it's barely half full or a little over half full. Um, uh, Brown Ranch, you know, it's, it's a much larger subdivision. Um, it's, you know, pretty small percentage of that's built out. Um, these things do take time and, and these subdivisions typically start in the fringe. So when they put them out on the outskirts, unfortunately they kind of have to be somewhat attached for a while until the rest of the city can catch up. And that's it's the developer's choice to build out there. Um, uh, and, but it's just the economic realities of, you know, that we can't get the roads that big on day one. Um, it just takes a while. So. Thanks Scott. And just to confirm that, uh, the the rezone here that's being requested like if it were to change the rezone itself isn't when that process happens as far as the the, the city would secure it if and when a developer came in and actually came with a plan of what to do correct and yes so any part of the plat right yeah any traffic and studies or conditions at this point would be speculative so when they come in um they you know we have unit counts lot counts what have you at the time of development and with that, it triggers mandatory traffic studies so they can evaluate what those capacities are. Um, with that, we also have them look at the pedestrian connectivity to make sure there's a viable route to our system in some fashion. Sometimes that's kind of circuitous initially until you know the larger road networks get built. But um, if there's turn lanes warranted, those kind of things, that all gets um, done as part of that study, and they have to meet those requirements you know, for public health and safety to meet those standards in order to develop. Um, sometimes they'll identify offsite improvements that need to be done in that in those cases like the Niagara Hill Crest roundabout's a good example you know some of the developments that were occurring up um, to the east of 6700 were contributing to there and kind of took it to its critical threshold the city then lumps that into its capital priorities and that's you know we're ha happy to report that that's planned and scheduled for next year um, and so as as these things start approaching capacity we work on design get through design and acquisition and then and build them into our capital plan to, to build Thanks, Scott. Cheers. So, Scott, um, I'm sorry, go, can I ask Scott real quick? So last time we had the Ogden conversation, it was 11 million. So we went up to 15. Our, <laughs> yep, our prices have gone up 30 to 40% our construction bids um, in about a year. Um, wow. Pricing is, is out of control, yeah. So. Okay. <laughs> and land, land values. We're seeing like some of the, not on this type of road, but I mean, just to give you a feel for your realtor, but. Some of those towns and lots are going for over a million dollars an acre. Um, yep. It's it's a tough time to do projects right now. <laughs> we're still trying. We're still doing a lot. But. Go ahead, Chan. Another question for Scott, since you're already here talking to us. Um, you have been able to add some additional walkways using some recycled materials on the north side of the road. This particular area going, well, does this particular area, have you been able to add in those recycled materials to add some walking paths? Um, I haven't studied this one specifically. So yeah, you're talking about the piece that we added in front of the bridges this year. So yes. because we know we can't do the large road, we don't want to build sidewalk to then just tear it out when the large road does come. We do um, like millings trails on an interim mm -hmm. basis to at least get out of the mud and get separated from the roadway. Um, so we're always open to opportunities for that. I think this particular property, there's a couple in between it, if I remember right. Um, that we don't have the right of way to do even that. Um, but uh, as those opportunities do arise, or if there's maybe just one property that's in between and we can just do one acquisition and open up that whole area, um, we would, a lot of times we would work with the developer um, as part of their development process to, hey, can you reach out to your neighbor and try and secure this so that you have a viable pedestrian connection? And in that case, we can justify, um, you know, allowing the development to go forward kind of thing. Um, to make sure that we have good connections or maybe taking a different route um, to get a safe connection to the pedestrian network. So um, yeah, those are, that's, that's a tool in our toolbox as those things come before us um, at, this, at the development stage, generally not at annexation, but, okay. or at rezone. But. So the simple answer is at this moment, there are no recycled materials adding to a walking zone in front of this particular property for the city. Correct, at this okay. time, but with development, that would, that would come into play. Because um, we, we want to give that, that neighborhood a connection. Yep. Has got anything else? Uh, I would just say that uh, just for to bring it back to the uh, specifically the zoning aspect. Obviously, there is a you know uh, what is it a 10, 10 unit difference if it's single family homes and a you know considerable difference if it's if it's not. Um, based on what we've seen, I mean, yeah, there there is a uh, the apartment complex just south. Does it make sense to 
build another one if you're a developer right across the street? I, I don't know, not a developer. Obviously, it's something we you know we should think about, or if it's a concern. Um, but I would say what we've seen. I, I think what we've seen a lot um, recently has been an, an interest from developers in kind of mixed, uh, kind of housing option type development. And in that case, I think we would end up seeing some kind of you know we, a PD a subdivision something. Um, they're not just going to go and, and build that without it coming before us. I don't think so. Well, I think all concerned. this is driven by demand, right? It's all driven by demand. And just like we were talking about the one across the street, which is an apartment complex, the first built, and as they said, the second one is going to be the same. Well, not really. He came in front of us and he said, it all depends on demand. I might do duplexes instead because the demand is not for the apartment as we thought. So even though we want to keep in mind that at this time we're allowing the apartments and we're allowing you know the the high density should we approve the zoning um i suspect maybe if mr renfro is involved that they would like the zoning so they can sell their property as a higher price tag which is smart i would do the same um but that means that we just at this time we we have to think we have the neighbor who's here who's talking about concern we have the community who's here and that's who we represent and that's what we have to think about as well we've We've also approved a lot of high density this year. We have apartments allowed on Sunnyside and, um, and what's the other street? Anyways, we've approved a lot. And like Scott said, these things take time. Do we have to approve any more at this time? I'm not sure. Chad yeah, is I mean, smiling because he's the Mr. High Density. <laughs> I, 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 I agree. I mean, it's a valid, valid point. Um, I think. The thing for me that makes this a kind of a no-brainer is that it, it is, it's right next to a bunch of amenities. Uh, it makes sense to be here. Um, so. I have a couple of concerns. Go ahead, Jan. Um, one is, uh, we've, those of us who have been on the planning commission long enough know that when a builder says, no, I'm not going to put apartment houses in, that that's yeah. <laughs> or they can change. They can sell it in the middle of the process, and it can be all one house. So we've been there. Yep. That's academic. I guess there's nothing we can do about it. The second thing is, again, what's the? Can you talk about that? The best laid dreams that go go astray or whatever. Uh, we've been told also before about workforce housing, the changes midstream. Base camp. It's a good example. I don't know how you assure that quote. Workforce. I mean, sure, the market could change, and that builder could decide, I'm not going to stick to the workforce. I can get a, I can get 2,500 bucks for an apartment house or whatever, a unit in an apartment house. So, I guess there's no control over that, is there? No. I, I, well, I, I would say at, at this at this stage, there's none. Yeah, there, there's nothing we can do to do anything at this stage as far as guaranteeing that, um, because but it's I just the zoning. It's, like the do we have power to do that elsewhere? Potentially, yeah. right? But not, not here. Not at like this. Unfortunately, is one of those. If 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 we were to approve it, you have to be okay with the the potential consequences, or, or, and also know that it could also sit here for forty years and nothing could happen. Yeah. So I understand that. I just need to raise it. Yeah. Well, it's, 100%. A, it's also a smaller parcel, right? And so smaller pa parcel for developers. We have we had one who spoke earlier. Um, in order to make more money, the higher density makes more sense. So it's highly, um, in order for them to make money on the small parcel, it's a high probability that that's what's going to happen. You know, because otherwise, if we go with single family, it's, it's just not the return is not the same. Yeah, yeah I, I don't know, but I think I, I do think we should. We've come across this before. If we're approving R three A. We should prove that based on the fact that that could be what is built there. Yes. Yep. Right. Um, however, I don't think the question is like how much density we would prefer or how much density we've done before. I don't think that's what the code, how the code tells us to think about. The code tells us to think about a few things, including whether it's in conformity with the concept of the master plan and whether it's at first to public, you know, health, safety, and welfare. So the question is, if it's built to maximum capacity, how does it impact what's in the code? Yep. Yep. Right. Not, not, you know, again, not our preferred 
afraid of growth. But the, the, the something like that. So, yeah. so it's it's the concerns that people spoke very specifically to about uh, traffic, traffic, uh, but bike again, path, not um, not preferred not preferred traffic, but traffic that impacts you know Correct. Their, their health and their safety. And so, um, I mean, I think that's what we need to base what the decision on is on and how that acts. Thanks, Steve. Knowing that Ogden is not done for 15 years. <laughs> Richard? Scott did not hear me. You got anything to say, bud? Yeah. Okay, the, uh, go for it. I think the location of the property uh, near amenities that may eventually encourage people not to get in their cars is a good thing. If you're going to build multifamily structures, closer in is better than farther out. Yep. Um, the uh, the speculation of a, is it going to be you know 10, 15 story apartment buildings or some nice townhouses? Uh, we can't speculate on that at the moment. Although Steve makes a good point, you have to consider you know weigh those those uh, balances. But I think based on the staff review and what we're looking at in terms of. The goals we have for this community, I think th this property lends itself to a, a multifamily approach. Okay, thanks, Richard. Anybody else? Phoebe? Yeah. Nothing? Might as well? But why not? <laughs> um, it, yeah, I mean, I think this, this planning board knows that I'm the first one that always um, balks at changing to an R3A and part of me always asks like why didn't why not R3 why R3A because that R3 and, and I'm not asking that angel to you I don't want you to come up and answer that um, but that always is a question in my mind and we also have always been very cognizant of what the possibilities are and usually I'm the one that will will not like that but this time I'm I liked your statement, Angel, when you said, uh, and David, that the infrastructure is there, and that lends that place kind of lends itself for more for an R three A, um, and that way we don't take up some of the outside agriculture space that's outside that may get annexed, and and this board has actually denied some of those that have been on the periphery that could really. Um, change the way it looks from the outside coming in. This is already on the inside. The infrastructure's there. Richard, I agree with you. It lends itself to walking places. I mean, that's the trail. We've, the staff, we've, you know, I've been here a long time. I've seen the city make it work and build on, and, and the cart doesn't come before the horse. You've got to have that subdivision, and then the road will get built and widened. And so, yeah, I mean, I like it um, for all the reasons presented. To the gentleman who walks your dog and you don't see police and you feel felt like you felt isolated and not protected, I think that's an outside issue that we at the Planning Commission really can't address that. I mean, if, if there's no police presence, I know the police is, would love to hear from you and, get, and say that you would like more patrol in that area. I, I know they would, and I know your concerns are very valid, but yeah, that's, for what it's worth, that's my two cents, um, and that's it, yeah. Yeah, just a second, Phoebe's a comment. Uh, yeah, by all means, um, John, get get a hold of Chief Hall. He, he loves, okay, <laughs> well, we'll, we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll, maybe, maybe we can tell him to put some pressure on him or something, I don't know, but um, they, they are really responsive to public comment and opinion, so um, anyway. If you guys are ready, um, it seems like everybody's kind of ready, set. Okay, I will entertain a motion. All right, I hereby make a motion to recommend approval of the rezone request for the IELTS rezone to an R3A medium high district, high density district. The request meets the code criteria based on the evidence and testimony presented at this hearing and in the staff report. Uh, I second. second. Delphine? Thank you. Uh, any discussion necessary on the motion? No? No? Okay. Uh, all right. All those in favor? 
Aye. All those opposed? Okay, the motion passes unanimously. Staff, other business? Uh, just one thing to note, um, the next planning commission meeting scheduled for September 13th, I believe. Um, we do not have any items that will be canceled. And then both Jace and I, uh, for the second meeting in September, will be at a conference in Colorado Springs. Okay. Uh, so we will not have any planning commission meetings for the month of September. Okay. Uh, real quick, actually, just for the folks that are out here that were here for this agenda item, uh, rezone does go before city council. Correct. Correct. So folks, just if for any reason you were upset about our decision tonight, you want to go voice your opinion again for or against, um, this item will be on, do we know what when it will be yet? What planning uh, commission meeting or city council meeting? It'll be September 5th. Okay, so September 5th, this same uh, rezone will be uh, at city council, okay? Just so you know. Yep, yep, same, same spot. All right, so no meetings through September. Um, you guys have anything else? No? Can we tell everybody about your new appointment? Yeah, uh, everybody, Steve is on the uh, board of the Montrose Community Foundation, right? No, hospital, oh, community foundation, yeah, sorry. Community foundation, so, um, yeah, so congratulations. They, they, they got a good board member in, in you, so that's great. Um, yeah. So I, I think that's it. Uh, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. All right, thanks, Jan and Phoebe. Phoebe, Jan. All right, uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. And meeting is adjourned.